Imagine going to your first martial arts class. You show up excited, but your movements are clumsy and awkward. Everyone spends the rest of the class laughing at you and embarrassing you. Obviously, this would never happen in most martial arts settings because martial arts usually has great culture around being a beginner and progression. However, what if you decide to make your first video, or give your first speech, or ask someone out on a date, or share your art with the world in whatever form it may be? If you deliver anything less than a masterpiece, be ready to be humiliated. Of course, just like it is impossible to avoid being awkward with your movements in your first martial arts class, it is also impossible to avoid being awkward with your first video, but nobody is going to care about this. You could even be a little kid making your first video, and upon unsurprisingly delivering something short of a masterpiece, it is completely normal to be humiliated by your peers, and even by adults, apparently. In fact, a very toxic and paralyzing word could be used to describe you. That word is, of course, cringe. I've been fascinated by this word. I went back and watched a bunch of TV from the 90s for a while to see, were things not cringe back then, or what? Nope. Everything was even worse. The constant fake smiles, the fake personalities, the awkward interviews, and so on. But see, that was back when you didn't have to go see your psychologist and get diagnosed with severe PTSD because you had an awkward moment once. Cringe seems to be one of those words that all of a sudden becomes a thing out of nowhere, gets used and then overused to a point where everything becomes it. In fact, is it cringy to even talk about cringe? At this point, probably. It's almost as if everything that you could ever say or do is now cringe, and all of a sudden, nobody wants to say or do much creatively. It has always been the case that the tiny minority created and the vast majority was paralyzed, but that tiny minority is now getting even tinier. The generation growing up with constantly seeing this on a daily basis will have the most paralyzing childhood trauma. It's sort of like having an angry dad around who yells at you to shut up every time you open your mouth as a kid. See, from very early on, both consciously and subconsciously, you'll learn that you want to be anything but cringy, but there's one major problem with that. Most paths to mastering anything in life require you to be a beginner and suck for a very long time. Unless you get very lucky and happen to be involved with something like particular martial arts that usually have great culture for the most part, and even then it's not perfect, get ready for insane amounts of embarrassment and humiliation if you're ever going to master anything. But why is this so painful? In fact, it's so painful that sometimes you feel actual physical pain. Imagine you were dropped onto a random street in a random city, and I gave you a promise. Do really embarrassing things, but every person that witnesses it will never see you again, will never have any sort of impact on your life guaranteed. You would still have an awful feeling in your stomach. That fear and discomfort makes absolutely no sense rationally, but it's because at no point throughout our human existence would we have ever been presented with such a scenario. Throughout pretty much all of our existence, we lived in small tribes where everyone knew everyone. Let's say you're a guy and you develop that cringe reputation, at best, you're not getting laid and reproducing much, and at worst, if you rub too many people the wrong way, you'll be put to death. So essentially, it is heavily ingrained into your DNA that cringe really equals genetic or actual suicide. There was a short window there between the small tribal setting and the advent of the internet, which is really a large tribal setting now, where at least rationally, this did not apply. For example, you could try to create yourself in New York, and if that didn't work out, you could fly over to LA, and recreate yourself there. And that creatively was probably the least scary time, again, at least rationally, because it's still very hard to feel a certain way when your DNA has evolved in a completely different setting for almost its entire existence. But now with the internet, we're really back to the tribal times, but on a very large scale. In some ways, it's nicer because at least you won't be put to death usually, but in other ways, it's even scarier because now you can have millions of people make fun of you and humiliate you instead of dozens. You really have no idea what this feels like unless you personally experience it. No matter how well you approach it from a rational point of view, you still have this unexplainable feeling in your gut, almost something that is inseparable from your DNA at this point, that the next thing that's going to happen is that you will be dragged out on the street and burned alive. In the face of these consequences, it is understandable why people don't want to be cringy, but it comes at a huge price. See, there are two ways to not be cringy. Once in a blue moon, it does happen that in the perfect field, 
with the perfect genetics and talent, with perfect luck and all the stars perfectly aligned, somebody becomes a master at something with not absolutely none, but still very little humiliation. That person is not going to be you. In fact, it's so rare, it's not even worth talking about. So there's really only one way to not be cringy. See, if you never say anything, you fix that problem completely. If you never show your work to anyone, you fix that problem completely. If you never give an interview, you'll never say anything stupid, feel awkward, or humiliated. I think the funniest thing is when a high-level politician who has achieved so much gets some irrelevant fact wrong and we have hordes of absolute nobodies talking about how somebody could be so dumb for weeks. I mean, yeah, we could sit here all day and criticize politicians, but I know if I had a camera in my face every time I spoke for years, I'd be saying a lot of dumb shit. Never saying or doing anything is the only and the absolute solution to this problem, and most people have cleverly figured this out, but it does come at a huge cost. You will never be good at anything. Let's make a few things clear. This is not about never laughing again at your own or other people's humiliation. In fact, I do it all the time and it's fun. But I also see people get so serious and catastrophic about it way too much. The reality is that the interview you're watching is awkward at the guest's expense. And the only reason it's not at your expense is because you're not important enough to be interviewed. Next, this applies only to mastering something. It's okay, in fact, necessary to be humiliated if you're trying to get better at public speaking. If this is your mom posting on Facebook about how to keep a man around and it involves eggplant and squirt emojis, this does not apply. Don't embarrass yourself just to do it, but realize that it's a part, and in many cases, a big part of your creative journey. Next, this isn't about watching a beginner's video and sitting there through the cringe. No, turn it off. You don't have to watch someone suck with their novice speeches. But to expect anything else is insanity. If you walk into your gym and some guy just started working out and can only do two pull-ups, you don't have to sit there and marvel at it, but why would you ever go up to him and make fun of him? Sometimes it's not humiliating yourself just as a beginner either. If you watch Bill Burr on David Letterman in 2011, you might actually experience physical pain. He messes up a joke pretty bad. You can see the disappointment and the humiliation in his face. And the only thing people really commented about on that whole bit was how he messed up the joke and how he looked uncomfortable up there that day. Put this in perspective. This is Bill Burr, easily one of the best and most talented comedians in the world today, with two decades of experience at this point, messing up a set that's supposed to be a few minutes long. If that's what happens to the best, you and I with our average talents have absolutely no hope. So what do we do about all of this? Well, if you're part of an audience, which no matter how creative you are, you probably consume other people's content, it's to perhaps have a little more empathy. But approaching the problem from the audience's perspective is an impossible task. As a creative person, you have to sit down and ask yourself this. Are you willing to be cringy? Are you willing to humiliate yourself over and over again? Are you willing to commit what is suicide to your DNA every day and feel that in your gut? These are the important questions. This is why you're paralyzed. It's not because you couldn't possibly work hard. Everybody's always talking about working hard. But what's so hard about working hard when every other one of your neighbors is doing it? Something can only be hard if most people can't do it. When I was at the Air Force Academy, I knew a few people that were absolute savages. You could hold them as a prisoner of war for years and you wouldn't break them. But they would get up in front of a class of 12 to give a five minute speech and they would shake and sweat and stutter like a scared little kid. This is how scary humiliation really is, and this is what you have to overcome. Trust me, if your creative endeavor doesn't work out, you will have absolutely no problem working hard for decades at a random job like the majority of people do every day. So sit down and ask yourself, are you willing to commit suicide every day? Maybe the answer is no to you. Some parts of this are indeed glamorized. Maybe you have little children to feed, and that's more important. But if you do commit to this, I will say one thing about the journey. You will never feel as alive and as exhilarated as when you put yourself on the line to be humiliated. There's nothing you can compare it to. I remember the feeling I had in my gut jumping out of a plane for the first time. That type of fear doesn't even come anywhere close to the fear I experience when serious public humiliation is on the line. It's really the closest 
and the safest way to play with death without really dying, at least in most cultures of the world today. If you start on this journey, you'll have your ups and downs. Sometimes you'll be humiliated and deal with it well. Other times the humiliation will be so strong, it might put you down for a bit. During those times, write out the following. Hang it up on your wall, do whatever with it, but have it nearby. The famous philosopher, Billie Eilish, once said, Everybody's going to die, and nobody's going to remember you, so fuck it.